Hi, everyone. Welcome to our talk for this afternoon. I hope everyone can hear me fine. My name is Jennifer Bissell. I'm a faculty member at, in political science and the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley, and also the faculty director of the Center on Contemporary India in the Institute for South Asia Studies here at Berkeley. And we're delighted to be here this afternoon, unfortunately not in person, but nonetheless still here to welcome our guest for today, Gilles Vernier. Gilles, if you wanna go ahead and join us on screen, um, I'll give people a little background on you. Thank you so much, it's wonderful to see you. Okay. Um, Gilles is an assistant professor of political science at Ashoka University. He's also very importantly, the co-director of the Trivedi Center for Political Data, which has been an incredible resource for political scientists, reporters, um, people from all aspects of the social sciences who are interested in politics and the bureaucracy in India. It's a really wonderful um, data source that I think we'll be seeing some evolution in the future, but it's it's a fantastic resource that Gilles has masterminded and, and brought to life for us. Um, he's also currently a visiting assistant professor at Amherst College. So we have him in the US this year um, and in the Bay Area today as well. Um, this talk is sponsored both by Political Science and mm -hmm. the Center on Contemporary in India and also by Stanford University. I think Soleil Prilliman is on the call with us today. This has been a joint effort to get Gilles to the Bay Area. So thank you, Soleil, for um, coming up with this idea and working with us to get him here for this event. And I'm really excited to hear about this survey, which has been an evolution that I've gotten to talk with you about over the course of the last couple of years. And I'm, I'm really ex just thrilled to see this version of it. Um, such an important topic on women's political participation in India. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you so you can tell us about this work. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Yeah, that is right. Sorry, Gilles, I forgot the the the, <laughs> the dirty details. So everyone, there's a Q&A box on your screen. Please, if you have questions, put them in there. And when um, Gilles is finished, I will moderate the Q&A for him <clears throat> um, in this format. And so we'll have the talk and then we'll do Q&A after. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and, and I really want to thank you, the Center for Contemporary India and in Punita. Uh, and the Institute for South Asian Studies, and sorry that uh, for um, hosting me. Uh, um, it's a little bit strange to uh, fly across country to uh, deliver a, a lecture at Berkeley from uh, across the bay, but um, I think we've all done uh, and seen stranger things happening uh, over the past two and a half years. And in fact, it gives me a, an opportunity to uh, express solidarity with um, students and student workers and grad students uh, who are uh, currently uh, asking for uh, better uh, work conditions. So uh, if uh, shifting the talk online is a tiny token of you know, solidarity, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, do that. Um, so this presentation is a first look into the result of a survey that uh, we conducted in 2019 before the pandemic in uh, Ariana. Uh, this is really a very modest contribution to uh, a burgeoning literature uh, on women's participation in um, politics in India. <clears throat> so we know that across all levels of representation in India, women's representation is lowest in state assemblies, currently 7.2% across all state legislatures. We also know that the share of women among candidates is lower than among elected representatives, and that the overall share of women candidates in state elections grows more slowly than uh, representation ratios. India has extremely low levels of women contestants, despite the fact that women make almost half of all women representatives elected in local bodies, municipalities and panchayats, and despite the fact that <laughs> women are now outvote men in, in 24 states in, in state elections. Um, most explanation uh, for the low participation of uh, women in politics uh, focus on demand side barriers to entry, uh, essentially the gatekeeping role of parties and male politicians. 
Um, the literature on women participation in politics in India has also explored the uh, supply side aspect uh, of the question. Outside party gatekeeping, general explanations on factors that restrict women's ability to run for office include uh, uh, income constraints, uh, breadwinner constraints, household composition, the age of marriage, uh, the resilience of hierarchical social norms, uh, all factors that amount to societal impositions on women. One aspect that we find relatively absent from this discussion is the possibility of self-imposed barriers to entry, notably connected to the question of political ambition. Uh, in our discussion with party officials, quite often you hear that uh, they would love to field more women candidates, but women don't show up to actually uh, apply for the position or apply for the tickets, right? And given the structural inequalities that women suffer from, and given the gendered specific barriers to entry into politics that add to the barriers that apply to all aspiring politicians, one could imagine that awareness about these obstacles hamper the political ambitions and perhaps even the interest for politics of potential female aspiring politicians. So what we do in this paper and with this survey, uh, and we, is Susan Osterman, Julia Kowalski, both at the University of Notre Dame and I, is seek to assess the degree of interest for politics and of political ambitions of men and women who serve in elected rural bodies in the state of Haryana to see whether we find or not a gender dimension to political ambition. There is, again, a large literature on women's participation in Panchayat, but we find that the political aspects of women's participation tends to be overshadowed by a focus on the effects of women's participation in politics. Much of the literature of, on women in Panchayat is concerned with quota effectiveness, outcome measurements. The question of electoral competition in reserved seats is often overlooked as if the mandated character of women's representation in local bodies made the whole question of politics and election and, and electoral competition um, irrelevant. As a result, we do not have a lot of information on how women involved in local politics see themselves, on what decided them to run for office, on how they think about their political careers or their political engagement in general, and therefore on their political um, ambitions. Um, to address some of these questions, we ran a survey of Sarpanches in 2019, before the pandemic, to find out what men and women who serve in panchayats across Haryana think about politics, think about, <coughs> sorry, think about their role, and whether participation in local politics turns into higher ambitions. We thought and we still think uh, that it made sense to conduct this survey in Haryana for multiple reasons. Uh, one, because we were there uh, at the time, uh, so of course that makes sense and that was convenient, but more importantly, second, because Ariana is a state where gendered structural inequalities run particularly deep. Ariana, as uh, all of you know, uh, <coughs> fares poorly on most women-related welfare statistics, sex ratio, infant mortality, malnutrition, women participation in the labor force, and so forth. The state also has a poor reputation with regards to women's safety, caste conservatism, the resilience of honor killings. And third, and despite, and perhaps because of these poor statistics and because of this social reality, Haryana has among states in India a comparatively higher level of women participation in uh, state politics. Before 2019, before the 2019 state elections, Haryana had the highest share of women in its uh, Vidhan Sabha, which was 14%. About that, uh, it's of course useful to remember that Haryana is a small state with a small assembly and that small number or small variations of women in its assembly uh, push or lowers the percentages. So when we say 14% of women in the uh, Haryana State Assembly in 2014, it actually means 13 women out of 90, right? <coughs> Finally, uh, Haryana politics tends to be dominated by a few elite or dominant caste groups. The bulk of general category MLAs in Haryana belong either to various upper caste or to uh, various Jat communities. And the latter, through the institution of Kha Panchayat, have a well-earned reputation of being 
quite well, extremely patriarchal and, and, and socially conservative. And so this makes the question of the interaction between caste and gender uh, re relevant. So to sum up, given its harsh conditions, Haryana seemed to be a good place to examine how gender and caste might shape or affect the political ambitions of the men and women serving in uh, local bodies. So to this effect, we ran a survey uh, in 2019, 1,100 villages or 1,122 sarpanches, uh, approximately one sarpanch out of five uh, in Haryana across uh, the 22 district of the state. Uh, villages were sorted according to distance from nearest town, total geographical area, number of households, population, percentage of different caste group population, um, and, and so forth. We also looked at political alignment between villages and uh, constituencies. Uh, the survey has sections on demographics, household composition, assets, uh, questions about the villages themselves, uh, upbringing, political participation, political ambition, political connectedness, political responsibilities, campaigns, and uh, pursuit of higher office. Uh, there was a separate instrument for women sarpanches, uh, which had questions about women in the village and questions on self-help um, groups. Um, men and women sarpanches were represented proportionally in each uh, district, and we also stacked sarpanches according to gender, education qualifications, caste reservation status, um, and uh, so forth. To build that sample, uh, which took a while, uh, we compiled data from the 2011 census, the village directory, from a public PRI data set that had a lot of details on Sarpanch and Panchet elections, as well as several TCPD data set on individual candidates, on, sorry, on individual incumbency, profile of legislators, general state uh, election results, um, and so forth. The survey was run in two phases. Roughly half of it was done before the 2019 state elections, and the other half was conducted after the election. This is not something that we had initially designed, but it turned out that soon, close to the election, South Punches were simply not available because literally 100% of them were involved in, in campaign uh, activities. Uh, we had an extremely high response rate uh, in that survey of 97%. Um, and to give you <laughs> a few descriptive statistics, um, women's sour punch in your sample tend to be older than men. They have slightly more uh, children than male sour punches. They are as educated, if not more educated than uh, men. In terms of caste, we found a higher a, a prevalence of upper caste sour punch and chamar sour punches among SC respondents. Uh, these are a uh, much higher proportion than in the population and a much higher proportion of upper caste than in the state assembly, where Jats, for instance, occupy more space. Um, the caste and the religion questions were open to respondents. We did not provide them with a list of possible answers. So these numbers reflect the subjective responses of our um, sample. But the one descriptive statistics that I think is uh, really interesting is the fact that out of the 437 women sarpanch that we uh, surveyed, 144, that is a third of them, um, contested and were elected in non-reserved seats, which uh, we think is, is a very high proportion. So the first questions that we ask is what factors affect politicians' motivations to run for office or so political ambition? Is political ambition guided by sociodemographic characteristics such as gender, caste, wealth, or other factors? And among all the factors that we considered, caste, gender, religion, class, we find that interest in politics is the main correlate of political ambition. Political ambition here means specifically being willing to rerun for the same position or to run one day to, for a, a higher position, which could be block or Zila Parishad, or, or which could be also the state assembly. And, and later on, we consider these two definitions of ambition um, separately. So now it may seem a little bit banal uh, you know, to make you know, that as a statement that one would expect men and women involved in local politics to nurture political ambitions because they are interested in politics, right? If they did not have an interest for politics, why would they serve in, in Panchet in the first place? Well, 
One answer to this is the fact that in our sample, not everyone actually expressed having political ambitions. What we find on the other hand is that men and women tend to be largely undifferentiated when it comes to political ambition and that interest in politics is a stronger correlate of political ambition than any sociodemographic factor. In other words, political ambition does not appear to be shaped or limited by specific sociological factor, um, which we think is both relevant and, and, and interesting. So the um, next question, yeah. Sorry, Jill, I'm just gonna interrupt you for a second because Anurvan has a question that I think would be useful to answer now. Yes. So everyone has the right context, which is, are the Sarpanches um, elected directly or indirectly in Haryana? I believe they are elected directly. Okay, thank you. Um, one second. All right, thank you. So the next question is what predicts interest in politics, since it is the component that uh, seems to drive uh, political ambition. Uh, and so given the fact that this is a strong correlate for plans to run for the same or higher office, it made sense to consider what socioeconomic factors are associated with this variable. So here again, one might have expected differentiated levels of interest for politics between men and women, given the reputation, the reputation of prevalence of Sarpanch Party in Haryana, one would expect fewer women to express an interest for politics than men, for instance. And so what we asked simply was to what extent politics interest of respondent, both at the local level, but also politics outside their village. And so here we use the linear model, we regress controls for gender, caste, age, education, children, land ownership, and whether the village is reserved or not uh, on interest and, and, and politics. And what we find here is that there are some social and demographic factors that actually predict political interests. And the first one and the strongest one is caste. As one goes from higher caste to lower caste, interest in politics uh, actually increases. Um, if we turn that proposition upside down for, for clarity, as one moves up the caste ladder from lower to high caste, from SC to OBC to intermediary caste to upper caste, the level of interest for politics actually decreases. And the effect uh, is uh, quite strong and, and clear. The second factor is gender, although not as strongly as um, caste. Uh, but counter to a standard societal narrative, or women respondents were more likely to report a higher level of interest for politics than all male respondents. It is not a stark finding, but what we think makes it interesting is that it's close. And again, we started with the assumption that since women get into politics through quota and are not often in charge of their own campaign, we would have expected you know, a somewhat different result. <clears throat> and we think it's significant as we saw that the one factor that leads to political ambition over uh, uh, other factors is political interest, which is slightly more pronounced among women and definitely more pronounced among lower caste across genders. And so this means basically that despite the challenges, despite the difficulties, despite the obstacles, the gatekeeping and everything, women actually are interested in uh, politics. Um, and the fact that so many women contest and win in general seats um, attest to that. Uh, the caste effect suggests that political interest is higher among those least served by politics, which is consistent with Mokolika Banerjee's argument about the meaning of the vote. There is greater interest for politics among those who tend to be underserved by it. What we do next <coughs> is separate rerunning What we do next, sorry, is separate rerunning for the same office from running for higher office to make a distinction between local ambitions, pursuing a long career at the same level, and extra local ambitions, aspiring to hold a higher position at the block level, Zila, or, or maybe even you know, the Vidan Sabha. And again, one could imagine that women's ambition would remain local and that men's ambition might be pointed towards, you know, more towards higher office. And here again, we find that it's not the case. We find that gender does not matter for rerunning for the same office. 
In other words, women are as likely as men to aspire to rerun for local office. Um, and the same goes on any other um, sociodemographic variable. And as far as running for higher office is concerned, uh, we find the same distribution of answers basically between men and women. And in both cases, as we saw earlier, uh, interest for politics remains the main uh, driver. In other words, sociodemographic factors, when included all together in a model, do not predict the difference of ambition between men and women. So how do these observations square with the literature on gender and ambition? So that literature usually says that men are more likely to state political ambitions than women. Uh, and recent contributions also show that when men and women state political ambitions, they do not necessarily mean the same thing. And that the type of ambition nurtured tends to be shaped by the varied horizon of possibilities that are open before men and women um, aspiring politicians. So most studies on gender and ambitions either focus on the general population. Uh, Fox and Lawless have a study on nascent political ambitions, and they find that by the time they are young adults, women in the US already express less interest in the idea of running for office one day. Uh, but there are other studies that focus on the specific population of men and women who are already active, already engaged at some level of politics, such as local politics, party organizations, parties, youth wings, women participating in campaigns, and so forth. Uh, a paper that just came out by uh, Amasari, McDonald, and Valbuzzi uh, recently, they recently surveyed 2,000 members of three center-left and three center-right party youth wings in Australia, Italy, and Spain. And they do find that women in youth wings are less likely than men to want to stand as candidates one day. But they also find that this gender gap narrows considerably, and in some youth wing completely disappears when they look at the desire to work for the party in the future. So their conclusion is that it's not the case that women are necessarily less interested than men in all types of political careers, but that general awareness of gendered and non-gendered hurdles to entry hamper their motivations to actually run. So there's a disconnect between interest and the, and the, the, the actual decision to run precisely because of the awareness of all the uh, existing obstacles. Right. So this points to the idea that while men and women bo may both have political ambitions, it may not necessarily translate into similar representations of what pathways these interests should lead them to take. And it may not translate into actual decisions to run for office. And many, many, in many ways, that makes sense. Many of us are interested in politics, but we're not necessarily considering running for office for all sorts of reasons. Um, in another paper, the 2005 paper, Fox and Lawless make a distinction between nascent political ambition, which uh, they define as the inclination to consider a candidacy, and expressive political ambition, which is the choice to enter a specific political contest. So nascent ambition is by definition abstract and aspirational, while expressive ambition is a concrete manifestation of a choice. And one, therefore, does not necessarily lead to the other, especially when there is awareness of the difficulties women face when seeking to enter uh, politics. And that's something that we find, we find a confirmation of that uh, in our uh, survey. We can derive from that that political interest may be detached from the question of actually running, particularly when the conditions to enter or the conditions to run are particularly harsh. Uh, but what it means is that women are not necessarily, are not actually uh, any less political ambitious than men, and they tend to be more interested in, 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 in politics. But <clears throat> that in and of itself may be insufficient to lead them to actually consider uh, running for office. Interest in politics may be a necessary condition to nurture ambition, but the decision to actually run relies on other conditions that have to do with the material aspect of getting into politics, money, and connections. Uh, and what we find in our survey and in the uh, open-ended questions that we have and in the interview that we conducted is that there is a complete awareness about the conditions of entry into politics, what it takes to get into, um, into, into, into politics. 
So until now, we have not paid attention to what all respondents mean when they report interest for uh, politics. Uh, the survey includes uh, open-ended questions about what interest uh, uh, or a respondent find in, in, in politics. We also conducted qualitative interviews uh, during the survey pilot through the survey execution. Uh, Julia Kowalski conducted a small shadowing exercise ahead of the 2019 state election campaign. And when asked to elaborate what about you know, what interests them in politics, women sarpanches exclusively focused on the service aspect of the job, SEVA, and on the opportunity to work on development related uh, project. One woman sarpanch told us, uh, and I quote, being sarpanch is about SEVA. It is about the community and development. Women are good at this. You've heard of Swatch Bharat. Women clean the house. They also clean India, end quote. And so when asked to describe their job, men gave similar answer than women. Seva is the essence of their duty. But contrary to most women respondents, they also evoked interest for the competitive aspects of becoming a sarpanch. In other words, both men and women describe the job in similar terms. They express uh, you know, a similar degree of interest for it, women perhaps more. But women displayed or acknowledged little interest for or knowledge regarding elections themselves, uh, which basically means that the quality of their interest in politics uh, actually differ. Again, the good news is that women and male sarpanch are undifferentiated with regards to the performance of their duty. They share the same representation overall of you know, what doing the job means but they do seem to hold very strongly different views with, regard, with regards to the getting the job aspect. Women Sarpanch spoke about their campaign without much enthusiasm. Many acknowledge that they were not in fact uh, involved in their campaign, that that aspect of the job was taken care of by male members of their families um, and, and so forth. And this finding is consistent with what uh, Nanking Choi, who is a researcher at Leiden, uh, found in her study of political ambitions among women elected representatives across Southeast Asia. Women political interests and ambitions, according to her, tends to be driven by a commitment to the common good, service to the community, and a desire to make a difference in people's everyday life. And that's what generally drives them to run for formal position. Women we spoke to very often discarded the notion of running for higher office, instead insisting that their duty lied in their villages. Uh, this is the, the villages where their duty resides. How can I help my village by being far away? Was one um, of our respondents um, told us. And so in that perspective, the pursuit of power is often conceived as a means rather than a goal. So this is consistent with uh, Anirban's uh, finding an argument that women's active participation in politics is acceptable to patriarchal male gatekeepers so long as their participation is defined in terms of service to the community. And this may help us to understand why many women who express a deep interest for politics at the same time may not consider necessary to run uh, for a uh, higher um, office. So one implication of these findings is that um, the fact that Haryana has comparatively more women in its state assembly, uh, more than most states in any, in any case, probably has very little incidence on other women's decisions to run. So first of all, as I said, Haryana is a small place, so we're not talking about many women or many seats for women MLAs in the first place. But when we look at women's participation in state politics more closely, we find that the space available for women's participation and representation is actually extremely reduced, not only in terms of uh, limited nominations and representation. In 2019, we made, women made only 9% of all candidates and 10% of all MLAs, but also in terms of sociological constraints, the space available for women in state politics is further reduced by the elitism of political recruitment, which is more pronounced for women than men. Uh, quickly, over the last four elections, women MLAs in Haryana have been twice as rich as their male counterparts. Uh, the average assets of women MLAs also doubles every election. 
Uh, they also belong more to locally dominant groups of the 92 women elected uh, in Haryana in the state assembly since 1967. 32 belong to the Jat communities, 22 belong, 32 belong to the Jat communities, 22 belong to upper caste. 25 have been elected in reserve, reserve seats, mostly Chamars. Uh, 13 belong to the Yadav, Cambodge, and Bishnoi community, and are elected in seats where these castes exert some form of local dominance. There is far more caste diversity among male MLAs. Overall, 32 different groups are represented than among women MLAs, uh, 12 groups represented. Another factor that sort of limit the space available for women is uh, dynasticism. Women MLAs tend to belong more to political families than men, although most women MLAs actually do not belong to political families. Of the 49 women elected since 2000, only 15 belong to political families. But when they do, they belong to prestigious or really high profile uh, political families. Vidya Devi is the widow of former Chief Minister Bansilal. Kiran Chaudhary is a four-time MLA, is also related to Bansilal. Uh, her, his, her husband is also a, 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 was a member of parliament. Nena Singh Chotala is the wife of Ajay Singh Chotala, the former of a former CM. Renuka Bishnoi is the wife of Kuldeep Bishnoi uh, and the daughter-in-law of a former chief minister. Savitri Jindal is the wife of industrialist and politician O.P. Jindal and, and, and so forth. And so as a result, we find that women in state politicians in Haryana outperform male candidates across parties. They have higher victory margins. They also have longer careers than men. But these results are not an effect of their gender, but are an effect of the elite character of their recruitment, right? And uh, the elite profile of women politicians in Haryana is of course more a commentary on political parties and their biases than a reflection of who among women nurture political ambitions. In the survey, we have a question about role model, who in Haryana may be you know, a women role model, and, and uh, 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 who is a you know, women role model, and, and usually they cited women outside Haryana rather than among those uh, elected in the state um, assembly. Um, and so that reminds us that pathways to politics available to women are not just limited on the basis of gender, but there are also class, caste filters that apply more harshly on women contestants. And it also reminds us that patriarchal political culture does not pose an obstacle to women from privileged families, but it does restrict pathways to non-elite uh, political aspirant. And so it's not therefore surprising that women who are interested in politics may not necessarily contemplate to actually run. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, or interviews and you know discussions on the field suggest that women sarpanch are perfectly aware of uh, what it takes to get into higher politics. So to sum up, when we started this project, we expected to find some gaps in political interest and ambition between men and women due to the specific challenges that women face in local politics in Haryana. What we found instead is that gender seems to play little role in the shaping of ambition and that by and large, women express higher degree of interest for politics, which in turn feeds into political ambitions. We expected to find a dearth of political ambition among women, but what we found instead is that women are as ambitious as men and display overall a higher degree of interest for politics. But our qualitative insights, however, point to the idea that they may not necessarily mean the same thing. When it comes to describing their interest in politics, women tend, women tend to have different concerns than our male respondents. And the main difference, the main uh, gap lies in a notable disinterest for the competitive aspects um, of the job. So these results are to our mind interesting as the presumption that women nurture lower ambition often dovetails on the idea that there are male proxies to their husband, uh, similar to findings uh, in, in recent work by um, Rachel Brule, Simon Chosha, uh, and, 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 and others, we found very little evidence actually that women serpents are proxies. Uh, we found that women in local politics just have different ideas of what their political engagement uh, means. One implication of this observation is that in order to have more women run, running for office, 
we need to pay attention to their ideas of political engagement, what it means to be a representative, what aspects of the job uh, they find valuable. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, the main obstacles to women's active participation in politics still lies, of course, with political parties. And that is where uh, interventions are necessary, uh, not into programs or campaigns that seek to build interest for politics among women, because simply because that interest actually is already there. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is the first glimpse into the content of this um, survey. Uh, here I focused on, nas on, on uh, national interest, on political interest and, um, and on political ambition, uh, but there are other aspects that we are, of course, planning to uh, explore. One of our next steps is to find more about women sarpanches elected in non-reserved seats. Uh, many of them run against men and they defeat them. Um, and as far as we can tell, only uh, very few of women running in, and winning in general seats were previously elected on quota. So there's definitely something uh, very interesting to explore here. Uh, so we plan to conduct in-depth interviews with a set of uh, women sarpanches and male sarpanches in reserve and non-reserved, uh, uh, sorry, uh, women sarpanches in reserve and non-reserved. Uh, seats. That's something that was delayed by the pandemic. And another plan uh, is to actually start to build a repository of Panchat election results, uh, which will give us much more data needed on women's participation in local bodies across India. Uh, building the data set for ahead of you know the, the sample um, gave us uh, ideas on what a good data set on Panchat elections could look like. And that's something that we plan to do um, uh, across uh, as many states as we can in India. And that would be a complement to the repository of municipal election results that uh, we've started building with Tarek Tachil and Adam Auerbach, in which already contains a wealth of information on women participation in uh, municipal elections. So I invite you all, I invite you all to uh, look also at this um, data set, send us feedback, and of course we uh, welcome uh, all manners of collaborations and, and contributions on, on this endeavor. Um, thank you. Thanks so much, Yael. That's fantastic. Um, so we have one question that's popped up. I'm going to check it out. Prerna, thank you. Um, the question is about the relevance. You can see it also, Shiel, but I'm just going to read out the questions for those of you who may be on the Facebook stream. So how relevant are parties to local elections? You've obviously commented on them to some extent, but um, do these still remain important when women sarpanches are getting elected? And maybe you could also talk about what the um, regulations are in Haryana about whether people running for this level of office are allowed to affiliate with a political party or not in Haryana. Thank you for that question, Prina. Um, so as far as I know, local elections are not fought on uh, party lines, uh, not panchayat, municipal may be different. Uh, but what we found is an almost complete engagement of Sarpanches and panchayat members into campaign activities. And so, you know, whether there are formal affiliations or not, um, actually on the ground does not really matter because there is in any case uh, an informal, a deep informal engagement uh, of uh, Panchat members with um, elections. Candidates, political parties rely a lot on uh, local representatives uh, to um, uh, to visit to 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 mobilize. Um, there are other there are other space or spaces also where um, local representatives and uh, parties meet, which of course is the block and the zilla, uh, where the contacts of course are, are extremely frequent. Before we move on to Soleil's question <laughs> and the other ones that are popping up, maybe you could just comment a little bit more on that to the extent that. I think maybe we had some sense or at least I did that people at the panchayat level are working on higher level elections. But I think the question was also getting at whether the party is involved in the panchayat level elections yeah. informally at least. Uh, formally, no. 
but that does not preclude the possibility that in some some villages are more important than others. They're not all of the same size. Uh, some village have a strong, you know, caste identity, and 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 you know, candidates in Vidhan Sabha or MLAs may have attachment with. So there, there would be uh, involvement, but not something that's sort of uniform across the territory. Um, and Soli, forgive me, I'm going to jump. Um, back to you in a second, but I want to ask Anurvan's question, which follows up on Prerna's, which is to follow up, do you see a difference? Do you have these data in the survey? And if so, do you see a difference in women's ambition based on their partisan identification? No. Oh, that's easy. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, sorry, short and simple. <laughs> uh, no, no, that's the, if, there, if it's not there, it's not there. At least, the, you know, and how you looked at it. So, um, yeah. Soledad has a question that given what you found, including how some of the expected constraints that you identified that are in the literature are not in fact, or don't seem to be constraints for women, what do you think can be done by parties or um, others to increase women's representation at higher levels? The easy, I mean, the simple answer to that is, uh, you know, just provide more space for representation, just nominate more, nominate more women. But what we know uh, about that is that the uh, the proclivity of parties to provide space for women is limited by a number of factors. Uh, uh, but is limited by a number of you know factors that you know speak to uh, the prejudices and the misconceptions that people in party positions uh, nurture about women participation in politics. In the different sort of work, in the different work that I do on the question, I, I, I speak to a lot of party people in charge of you know the candidate selection, asking them why don't you select more women candidate. And they usually give uh, one out of six usual responses and sometimes a combination of them. We would love to, but women are weaker candidates. Uh, they don't have enough experience. They don't have what it takes to do the hard job of being an MLA. Uh, only elite women can uh, perform. Uh, we would like to have more women, but women in politics tend to be proxies to male relatives. And, and the last myth is that, um, um we would love to find more women candidates but they don't they don't show up right they they, they don't they, they don't show up in the uh, informal primary that you know that is basically candidate um, selection so now what can be done and what actually we have done is to debunk empirically each and uh, each of these uh proposition each of these prejudice or myth you know one by one um, Francesca Gentianius is also doing work on uh, women participation in elections back to independence that basically shows that women tend actually to usually outperform men or, or certainly do not you know, underperform, uh, that there are no voter biases or no significant voter biases uh, against women um, um, candidates. Um, and 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 so forth. So there's, I think, a work of you know education that needs to be done on political parties themselves. Uh, I do not nurture a lot of hope in that regard, and I'm, I'm one of those who think that um, without mandated representation, uh, things are not going to uh, uh, improve um, anytime soon. Um, I have a follow-up question, but before I get to it, maybe you can answer Soledad's question about yeah. whether or not you have the sense of the interest in politics in the general population. I know that, you know, that's not your survey sample, but do you have any other sources that give you insights into that? Um, if I remember, we have about 10% of our sample who said that they were not interested at all by, by politics, despite being in, in, in Panchayat. Um, I don't have the other numbers at the top of my head, but there is a distribution across the three uh, responses. And I can take uh, Alba's um, question at the same time. Uh, interest for politics, it's a simple question, you know, to what degree are you interested in politics uh, from strongly, uh, very much interested, not interested at all, somewhat interested, somewhat not interested. So what we measure is the level of interest. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder is so I mean you're only interviewing people who are who are sarpunches. I'm wondering if there's something from the NES or another general population survey that asks about general political interests that would give you a comparison to show whether 
you know, the women in general, you know, there's more or less of a difference in the general population's interest in politics versus those people who go into becoming a sarpanch mm -hmm. by gender. I've not seen numbers associated to a question uh, formulated in that way, but we can only surmise from the rising uh, participation of women in election that it is the case. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think we would see such increase in women participation as voters if there was no uh, interest in politics present um, in, in, in the first place. Yeah. So um, just... I, one of the things that I thought, and it'll be obvious why when I say this, um, but one of the things that I found most interesting was your comment that in the interview that was done, there was a woman who said, you know, this is about, not it's not just about service, about Seva, it's about doing work for her village, and how can she do that work for her village if she moves up to a higher position? Yeah. And and you haven't touched on that as much, and I think that's an uh, perhaps something interesting to dig into given that if you asked the average person whether they thought it was their representative's responsibility to do things for the village, they might say that it is. Um, I think there's some variation in, in expectations about that, but I, I wouldn't expect people to fundamentally believe that it's of no responsibility that the MLA do something for villages in general, or perhaps their home village in particular. So. Yeah. I wonder if you've thought about that characteristic of these responses and the degree mm -hmm. to which, you know, it's something about Seva. Seva could be perceived as local, but then men talk about Seva as well. So not just the lack of interest in the election and the competition itself, but also that perceived lack of interest in moving up to a place that would be farther from home um, yeah. and what that means sort of politically. I think there's a perception also that getting into higher politics means to go basically through uh, intense competition for which there is, you know, a professed dislike. And so attitudes towards electoral competition or the competitive aspect of the job may be actually a self-imposed obstacle to uh, more um, participation in um, women in in in, in higher uh, politics, but that's that's one aspect that we we hope to develop in the uh, follow up qualitative interviews that uh, that that we are that we are going to that we're going to uh, run. That's great. I look forward to hearing more about that. Um, we have a sort of methods question from Prerna. She's wondering if there are some constraints when it came to the data collection itself, especially when surveying women since they exist in spaces that may not be publicly accessible. Can you tell us a little bit more about your process, who the enumerators were, where the surveys were done, whether that differed for the women versus not? Again, we are talking talking about Sarpanches, so they are public actors. Yeah. The easier so than... All the interview, yeah. So all thank you for the question. So all the interviews were conducted in person uh, over a period of four months, and as I said, the the, the response rate was phenomenal. Um, we uh, enumerators were recruited locally. Uh, they uh, spoke not only uh, Hindi but they spoke, you know, various shades of Haryanvi. Um, and uh, and we did spend uh, a lot of time um, training them. Um, the pilot was conducted uh, by us and and students from Ashoka. And if I remember, Prana was actually one of them. And so it's nice to see you here. And um, and uh, so yeah, so we did spend a considerable amount of time. Um, training uh, enumerators. Uh, but the person who uh, ran the survey for us uh, was very amenable to work with um, academics, uh, provided us real-time information constantly, was very open to feedback. It, it was, a, actually it was quite an amazing uh, experience. That's great. Are there any, I mean, given that, yeah. I think this is an area in which there's burgeoning interest in terms of being able to actually survey politicians at the local level. There are more people that are doing that on a um, regular basis, or at least there are among the graduate students at Berkeley. <laughs> so um, I wonder if you have any advice then to give to people who are interested in doing this um, kind of work, not just, 
I, I think, you know, we have some experience as academics doing village level surveys door to door, but with elected officials and how to think about that, whether mm -hmm. that's, you know, if you were to do this again, how might you do, what might you do? Um, and also I'd be interested in how you would think about doing it in moving up in the panchayat. If you were to think about looking at the block level or the district levels of the panchayat, you know, what would, what were your, would your expectations be or um, hypotheses be about both the practice of doing a survey at that level, yeah. but also whether you think that your findings might differ um, for people that are at that level of governance? Yeah. Um, working with Sarpanches was, I, I thought it was surprisingly easy. And, and I don't know if it's, you know, Ariana, if it's proximity to the election, I, I can't point towards specific factors, but again, you know, response rate was um, excellent. Interviews were, you know, conducted in, you know, excellent um, conditions. Uh, it's definitely easier, and especially for those who are, you know, starting, you know, in the field to actually start with those sort of elite interviews, sort of, um, um exercise uh, rather than a, a general population kind of survey uh, which has uh, a lot of you know different um challenges um my sense is that there is a, an availability of local elected representatives that we may not necessarily find uh in higher levels so uh, a former student of mine, uh, Raj Kamal Singh, uh, who's now at UC Santa Barbara, um, worked on Zila Parishad, and he tried to run a survey, and basically he found respondents to be in UP, and, he, and the respondents were totally uncooperative. But uh, long in-depth inter uh, um, interviews in the form of you know extended conversations. Uh, uh, were actually much more, much more um, effective. Um, my own experience, I mean, I've not done actually surveys with, with MLAs. I, I find uh, interaction with MLAs, they're usually, you know, very crafty and very strategic about their responses. And I, I would tend to spontaneously trust more the information that I get in a one-to-one, -one, you know, discussion uh, rather than through uh, actually a survey instrument. But I guess it depends, obviously, the uh, question that you ask. Um, I think it makes a difference if you ask questions about, you know, what they do and outcomes compared to questions about who they are and, and you know, and, and how they got into politics and, and certainly questions on, you know, the funding aspect, et cetera, which are, you know, much, much um, trickier. Um, again, um, I, I do find that the literature on particularly women in Panchayat sort of has eluded the question of, you know, who these women are. Uh, because, because of the quota, then therefore women are there. But who's contesting? And, and, and who decides who runs? To what extent do they have an agency in, in their decision of running? Um, how competitive elections in reserve seats are. They are actually quite competitive, right? Because the stakes are not lower because uh, the seat is reserved. Um, and so th these are these are questions that, you know, I would want to see, you know, more um, more um, explored. That, that last comment that you made actually speaks directly to this question that Alyssa has raised, which is, that you mentioned the perceived competitiveness of higher level elections might be one of the things that's deterring women. Um, but do you have evidence on the rate of elections that are uncontested in GPs? Yeah. So do you know, it, might it be the case that there are instances in which women prefer to participate in local politics because they can win those elections without having to actually contest? That's a great question. I don't have a number in mind. Um... From the municipal data that we have, we know that it varies a lot between from one state to another. Uh, West Bengal, for example, has a huge number of uncontested seats. Um, and uh, for Haryana, I would need to look, uh, but that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, it's one more example of why having the, those data on panchayat level elections would help us to answer um, yeah. questions that are outlying. Yeah, and there's actually a lot of, I mean, some states uh, do provide um, uh, 
uh, data on PRI, on Panchayati Raj institutions, and it's actually quite rich. Uh, level of education of um, of of panchayat members, uh, caste categories, age, uh, sometimes religion, um, and of course connecting that to the wealth of you know village level data that is now that now exists and available makes you know very exciting prospect for for future research. Yeah, it's just getting those election the, the actual elections data <laughs> that sometimes yeah. is um, <laughs> harder than the than than we might hope. But um, I'm sure that that'll continue to get better as we move forward, or at least that's the optimistic version. Um, but but you're right, having um, having this kind of individual level data mapped to village level and election data can should make for some really interesting and I would expect based on your mm -hmm. findings here some surprising insights yeah. as well yeah but since it's a small group of us and I see the names of the participant and I actually recognize most uh, of those names so hi uh, but uh, I, can I can I invite you know um, also you know for feedback and and uh, you know to see what people think about this question of you know, interest and in, in the meaning of engagement and maybe suggest that, you know, directions that we could look at, things that we have overlooked, um, that'd be very useful. Yeah, please feel free. I'm sorry that in this format, I don't have the ability to actually make you visible. Um, so I apologize to all of you for that. Um, but you should feel free to um, provide additional comments in the Q&A box if you have them. While they're doing that, Jill, was was there anything that you haven't talked about in the context of this um, presentation itself that was particularly surprising to you from the survey, from implementing it? I mean, I guess you were surprised that the um, response rates were so high, which was great. Was there mm -hmm. anything else that might be of interest that? The the one thing that surprised me is the uh, the number of women elected in general seats. And um, again, I, I don't think that most of these seats were uncontested. Uh, I think if that was the case, I would have, I, I would, you know, uh, we would have noticed it. Um, and I mean, that goes, you know, contrary to a lot of popular assumptions that are made about women participation that, you know, you, you wouldn't have, um, that you wouldn't have, you know, much women participation, you know, without, um, without, without, without quota. Um, I don't know if it has anything to do with um, a learning effect. Uh, I've not seen a lot of papers uh, after, you know, Rikil's paper uh, on, on participation of women in, in municipal elections in Bombay. Uh, it's already a fairly old paper. The sample size was very small. Um, and so... Um, and so I think it would be useful to sort of replicate, you know, uh, that kind, this kind of study in different places, and and look at, um, and and look at um, um, panchayat elections as well. Um, my sense is that, my intuition is that we would find something maybe similar to uh, the observation that I made about state politics, which. Uh, the pathways to politics are sort of mediated by, you know, the elite status um, of, of these women. Um, something that came out quite frequently in, in conversations that, you know, uh, we had with women sarpanches is the idea that uh, I belong to a good family and, and it's the responsibility of our family to care for the village. And so something that we did not really investigate, but we can push more in, in the um, qualitative interviews is to what extent, you know, this question of political interest and ambition is uh, expressed in, in individual or in um, collective or familial terms, right? It could be caste also. It's always, it's, you know, this very often you do hear, you know, this village is under the care of that particular, you know, caste, which is predominant or dominant. And and um, so that's definitely something that I would want to know more. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I'm just noting that Prerna has made it, not Prerna, sorry, I was looking at Prerna's name. Um, Punita has made it possible for um, others to become panelists. And I think you've actually all been unmuted now. So just Giving you fair warning, at least Alyssa and Prerna and Anurvan are the people that I see um, that you can now um, 
speak if you would like, <laughs> and if not, you might want to mute yourself. Um, but if you want to, if I know you weren't probably preparing for visuals um, as a part of this, but if anyone wants to speak up or um, make yourself visible to say hi to Gilles, you're welcome to do so. Mm -hmm. So Prina has a comment in the chat. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Oh no, the option to join now has been removed, Soledad says. So I'm not sure what happened, Punita. Maybe you can. I'll do it again. Thank yeah. you. I know that I I, I didn't want it. We threw you, we threw everyone off because I said it wasn't possible, and then Punita did her magic. Okay. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah. Hey, yeah, no, that's true. Actually, accessing um, women uh, sapunch was actually relatively easy because usually uh, the husband was not around. Mm. Um, so that definitely made things uh, easier. Hey, good did to you, you did you document where the interviews take took place? I'm curious yes. whether um, whether there were they were more or less in offices versus at the sarpanch's home, and whether that differed by gender. Uh, I think most of them were at home. Yeah. Alyssa? Yeah. Hi. Hey, Jean. Um, thanks for this. I was wondering, <coughs> if, during your qualitative interviews, if you all sometimes got the response of like, yes, I would love to run again, if, but it's only going to happen if I'm given the chance sort of thing. I feel like this is something that I remember a lot from talking to people and I think would be really in line with your all's argument about um, equal interest, but maybe like perceptions that maybe things aren't really in their their control. And so the answer is really in sort of elite mechanisms for, for nomination. Um, yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's, that's something that we could not really grasp. Um, through the uh, surveys, people were not very forthcoming with basically stating how they got there in the first place. Um, and so the, the, the qualitative interviews, I think, um, will, but that's definitely something that we want to look at. Thank you. Salida? Hey, Jill, good to see you. Um, so I wanted in this realm of more informal feedback and questions, you may already have a sense of this, but one of the things I'd be curious to hear from the qualitative interviews is what does political interest mean for men and women? Um, yeah. What does politics mean? How do these, you know, whether what that what what sort of the engagement you've already sort of articulated some of this around the differences between election interest um, but just really understanding even how aspirations might filter into the way that you conceive of politics such that your interest um, might yeah. vary the nature of what it means to be interested in politics varies across men and women yeah I mean, essentially it's what I you know mentioned earlier is that uh, the articulation of interest in politics was, you know, in terms of what politics enables, uh, you know, subconscious to do. Uh, the, the, the simplified way, you know, I put it is, is the doing the job versus getting the job, right? When, when you ask people, are you interested in politics? Is, are you interested in the uh, electoral game part of it? Or are you interested in the, uh, the, the doing part? Um, and, and there seems to be a really strong, uh, cleavage between men and women respondents um, on those um, on those aspects, which may point to the fact that uh, women may not be necessarily you know, in, in, in control of their own careers uh, when they are elected. Uh, that also points to you know, Alisa's remark. Um, and uh, I mean, these decisions, well, I mean, the little I know about, you know, deciding, you know, who runs, uh, it's usually a collective decision, right? It's, it's some form of collective decision. Some families belonging to a particular group, particular caste sort of get together and decide, so who's running this time, right? Um, and so uh, how do individuals emerge through that process is not something that I think has been really, uh, really documented. Um, I think there will be uh, punch at election. I don't remember, but there will there should be punch at election in Haryana pretty soon. So there's an opportunity to to do some field work. Anirban? 
Ajil, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, so uh, great to see this paper also with, uh, with the co-author is someone with, who was like fundamentally responsible for one of uh, one aspect of my theory. Uh, so it was like a random conversation with Julia that led me to certain things that you see. Uh, uh, also, thanks for the shout out. Uh, so it is, uh, it's not really a question, but it's like just a, generally a couple of comments, which is like, it is, I agree it is remarkable that you have so many women in non-reserved seats. And I don't see this, so I haven't checked across every state, but uh, the two states that I am familiar with, Rajasthan and West Bengal, uh, you don't see uh, women contesting unreserved, unreserved seats at all. I mean, to the extent that in some cases where we don't have data for West Bengal, we just, just generally, uh, when we don't have reservation data for West Bengal, I generally, it was, uh, it's such a good proxy that you could see if like all the contestants were uh, women, you could just assign that to be a, yeah. a female reserved seat. So, uh, so I definitely think that there is something going on and it is completely worth checking out as what is going on in Haryana. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, you were saying something? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, so that's uh, super interesting. I'd love to talk to you about uh, offline at some point about uh, questions about agency, but I'm also curious about how you measured ideas of proxyism. Uh, when you say that I uh, you don't find evidence that women leaders, uh, women mm -hmm. punches are proxies of men. Uh, because again, in Rajasthan, I would not expect such high differences. Uh, <laughs> because in Rajasthan, for example, if I look at the nomination papers, uh, about 95% uh, of the for numbers that they have are of their husbands or fathers or fathers-in-law. When I spoke to them over the phone, well, I did not speak. Uh, my research assistant, uh, who's a woman, uh, she did uh, that calling work. Uh, like about 80%, eight out of 10 of the people that we were able to speak to said, uh, said that I have no idea about politics. Well, you should just talk to my husband or someone else. So yeah, so I'm actually curious about a couple of things because it seems a little pretty surprising. It's great, but I'm yeah. just curious. No, there, there's a lot of you know information in this survey that's you know sort of good news, um, and some of it maybe not so good news. But um, <clears throat> I wanted to look at the uh, total women um, elected in non-reserve seats uh, in Haryana. But um, I wanted to do this for this talk, but it turns out that the data set we have on Panchayat, we, we, we kind of forgot to add the uh, um, status of uh, the seat. Um, and, and, and so I have it somewhere else, but it doesn't match and I didn't have the time to do that. But that will give us a definite answer to that question. Uh, it could be, you know, an effect of the sample, but... Um, but 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 I don't um, I don't uh, I don't think so. There may be the fact that the class composition of our sample is also pretty skewed, uh, and it's a lot of you know locally either upper caste, locally dominant caste, and you know that might give you know an element of also confidence in you know being in charge of your own career. Um, I don't know. Um, the evidence of proxyism that was more through the uh, interviews and the observations uh, rather than the um, rather than the survey uh, itself. I think Rachel and and, and uh, others have you know a uh, uh, pretty good um, instruments to um, to 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 measure that. But no, actually, we do have questions about uh, you know decision making and. Um, obviously, there's not the, the you know the answers are you know contrasted, but um, I wouldn't say that it's an overwhelming you know number of women who basically state that they're not able to take their own decisions. 
but maybe there is something specific about Haryana. I think the interest of building, you know, a, a cross-state data set uh, on 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 Panchayat is precisely to at least build the uh, empirical base, you know, necessary to um, to um, to look at these questions. So it's getting dark, and I'm slow, slowly disappearing. Yeah, the sun has set on the west coast. So, did you have another question? Yeah, though, if there are others, you can tell me to stop asking no, questions. Go ahead, it's just interesting. Um, Sheila, I wanted to, this is getting into outside the scope of what um, I know your evidence speaks to, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on the informal quotas that some parties are putting in place for women's representation in candidacy. Um, like, I think it was in UP um, where there was this, I'm curious whether, mm. since you said that sort of the key, one of the key mechanisms could be just fielding more women, whether you think that this kind of intervention would shift yeah. some of these outcomes. So as far as I can tell, there are at least three different parties who have introduced uh, a form of mandated or form of, you know, um, um, quota uh, among their candidates. And the three of them do it very differently. Uh, one of them, of course, is the Trinamool, 42% uh, of women candidates in the, in the last um, uh, general elections and about, I think, 30% of women candidates <laughs> in the uh, state uh, elections. And uh, here it was done you know, obviously, clearly, as a signal of you know gender inclusion, uh, it was done you know as a way to contrast the Trinamool against you know the uh, northern male invader <laughs> that you know the BJP were presented, or that's how they were depicted depicting it in any case. Um, and the way they did it is they uh, nominated women across all kinds of categories. Uh, some had modest backgrounds. A uh, few of them actually had you know were you know prominent figures. Um, the newspaper made a lot of hay about the, you know, the few actresses that they uh, nominated, but we found that actually it's really a handful of them. Uh, many of them were professional, many of them are doctors or they're theater personalities. So they, they actually, many of them have, you know, an elite background, but not necessarily defined by, you know, money and muscle and, and et cetera. But many of, uh, they were Muslim uh, women candidates. Um, also, and, and some of them from very modest origin. Um, the other party that does it is, um, um, help me, uh, Orissa, uh, Navin Patnaik's uh, Biju Dantadal. <laughs> there he nominated, all, all the women came from reserve seats. So he thought that, let me also sort of uh, make a, you know, um, a, a move towards, you know, toward, towards women and include them more. But uh, all of them but one, I think in the last general elections were uh, nominated in reserve seats. Um, and so that I, I thought was, you know, a very different way of doing it. And then, of course, there was the Congress failed experiment of nominating, uh, well, not quite 50%. Uh, they did not manage to find actually 50% of women candidates, but it was not, it was close, it was close to that. Uh, but that was done as a symbolic, that was meant as a symbolic gesture, irrespective of who the women candidates were uh, to a large extent. And um, that's not me, that's Susan's cat. And in case you were wondering. Um, <coughs> yes, one second. And, um, and <laughs> Stu. <laughs> and, um, and, and that, sorry, and that strategy was implemented in absence of anything else. So what I find fascinating in the Trinamool experiment is that uh, they did select women candidates who were also solid candidates beyond their gender. Uh, the BJD uh, chose to limit women representation to reserve seats, which I think it's indicating on, you know, uh, I mean, it is quite misogynistic in a way. 
And the Congress made a big symbolic gesture by appointing women who had no chance of winning. The most humiliating statistics I've ever seen in Indian politics, in Indian elections, comes from UP in that elections where, so we know that the Congress was decimated. They did some, they, they, they had lower, they had less than 3% of vote share. Their half of their women candidate are an average of 1.5% of vote share. So they actually, no, they had half the vote share that the men got. So obviously it's so low that it may not be very significant, but there was not even a blip of a sympathy effect for uh, what they uh, attempted you know, doing. And so that makes me think that, and I wrote about this, that uh, a strategy of inclusion will only work um, if a party treats you know, women candidates just like any other candidates and you know, apply also other criteria than gender. And what the Trina Mool has done, which I think is wonderful, is to normalize the idea of uh, women candidacies. Women, women candidates, and 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 by showing that they can actually perform as well, and 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 and, but not necessarily through you know the usual elite uh, recruitment uh, explanation that I find in other states. Thanks, thanks for that question, Soleil. That was really interesting. <clears throat> are there any? We're almost out of time, but are there any yeah. other questions or comments or feedback for Shiel? Yeah, no, exactly, exactly, Pritna. Right. Uh, they, they did it in UP because they knew it was a hopeless election. Uh, they sent a woman, uh, Priyanka Gandhi, basically, you know, uh, de defenseless and weaponless on, on a really, really tough battlefield. Uh, but in the few elections that actually mattered, like Punjab, they, they actually did not replicate that. Uh, neither in Goa nor, the, nor in... Um, yeah. But up makes no space for women either. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, the um the rest of the audience can't see what's in that's why I wasn't looking at it, what's in the um chat. So if any of you want to make comments on um anything else that's in the chat, please do. Um no. No. Okay, <laughs> but but just so you, so, um okay, um and that person isn't in the library, so can't speak. That's okay. That's a good excuse. Um, anything else? No, but thank you, thank you for the, um, thank you for the comments, and um, um, I got you know quite a few suggestions. I, I really look forward to being in touch with you, you know, in the future, not just about, you know, this particular paper or this survey, but for the, the broader work that uh, we want to do on on on, um, but on, on local political data. I, I think it's, uh, it's extremely interesting. And, it, uh, it's fantastic. And it's going to be so useful to so many yeah. other people. But thank you also for this paper, for this contribution to the burgeoning, um, I don't know if I can even call it burgeoning anymore, the now basically yeah. established work on gender yeah. and politics um, in India um, yeah. with major contributions from basically everyone other than me on this yeah. um, on this screen. So thank you all of you um, for being a part of that as well and for being here yeah. today. Um, and I, again, I'm so sorry, Gilles, that we weren't able to be with you in person, but thank you for visiting us um, in the Bay. And yeah. 